Stand up, give a round of applause for Dan Bradbury. Oh, good morning. I like that intro. I, I, I really want to hear myself speak. Um, so, uh, I, I'm going to try and make this next hour um, uh, very special. In fact, I, I'm going to give you something in this hour which, if applied, w will uh, add a, signific a very significant amount of money to your bank account. Out of curiosity, how many are here, just to kind of check I'm in the right place, how many of you are here because you want your business, your businesses, to make you more money? Show of hands. Okay, good. Out of curiosity, who, who's saying, actually, uh, it's not just about making more money, but it's about having more time to be able to enjoy that additional money? Show of hands. Good. Here's, uh, here's what kind of today is hopefully about. I think a lot of people learn how to grow uh, their business and make more money, but then they end up being time poor. And they end up hating their business, their career, because they've got no time to enjoy it. I think other times people figure out how to have more time to, have, uh, uh, to be able to spend on the things that they love, but then their business falters. And I think the, the challenge is to try and have the, um, figuring out the strategies that allows you to have the best of both worlds. I think that um, uh, the place to start today, which is a bit different for MPE, is my first business was actually in the... Um, uh, uh, coaching industry specifically, I wanted to be a professional squash player. And whilst I was training to be a professional squash player, I would coach. I would coach other juniors and uh, I would make money just an hourly rate. I was trading time for money and that was okay. That allowed me to ha uh, have enough money, enough income to be able to train um, uh, uh, to do what I really wanted to do. And it was kind of working for me. But after a while, the, um, uh, in the club shop, the, the previous pro left, and he used to restring and repair rackets. So I thought, okay, um, this is something I can do on the downtime between lessons. So I bought a racket restringing machine, it cost a few thousand pounds, and um, it, uh, in the downtime between lessons, I would repair rackets and restring rackets. But as I got busy and busier, I encountered a problem. There wasn't enough time to kind of fill it all in. And I figured out, you know what, I'm, I'm charging 15 pounds a, a lesson for, for the um, uh, kind of squash coaching sessions. And I was charging 10 pounds to restring a racket. And I, it was worth more to me to do the coaching and I enjoyed the coaching more than I did the restringing. So I said, all right, how can I have the best of both worlds? And I trained another junior from the club to be able to do, uh, to be able to do the restringing process. And I figured out that if I did that, while they were restringing the rackets, I could be making money by doing the coaching, and I would still be making a margin um, uh, from the racket restringing, even though I had to pay the junior. So I was making overall more money, and I'd created the leverage. Does that make sense? And uh, it was the first time when I realized um, that you could, uh, a business wasn't just about trading time for money, but you could create leverage. In exactly the same way, I also figured out if I charge somebody for a one-on-one -on -one session, I could make more money if I charge two people, a smaller amount each, but like the group training concept, which I know uh, MPE um, uh, talks about, and many of you implement in your studios, um, uh, means that overall, I would be making more money, I would uh, uh, have a better business. And um, when I got to the end of, um, I had a few injury problems and I decided I wasn't going to uh, pursue squash as a career, what it allowed me to do is I'd created a business that had assets so I could sell it. So I sold that business, the racket restringing business, to the, to the next uh, professional in line at the club. And I, I, there's three kind of core models I want to talk about this morning, which are direct, directly applicable to you and will ultimately make you more money. Uh, the first thing is, you're here, uh, many of you are here because you go, I want to make more money. But I, what I think is um, a mistake that I made, and I think most business owners make, is they don't understand what drives the money in the first place. They, they end up just pushing for more clients, pushing for more income, and then they end up in this feast and famine situation. A better question to ask yourself is, how do I create a more valuable company? 
And yet, if I was to ask you, out of curiosity, how many of you in this room know how much your company is worth today? Show of hands. Okay. So this is an interesting question. How are, how are, how are companies valued typically? But if you were looking at buying another studio or buying a studio, how, how, would you, how typically would that studio be valued? How would you figure out how much it's worth? Okay, assets and goodwill, good, okay, uh, 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 that's good, what else? Turnover, good, what else? Leads. The, the number of leads it generates, good, what else? This is good, this is good answers. I, I, should, ex I should have expected nothing less than an MPE crowd, but, uh, uh, say again? Square footage. Uh, the square footage, so it's the size of the facility, good, what else? There's a, there's a key word that's not been mentioned, stock's another good one, but there's a key, good, profit, okay, so, to be slightly simplistic, um, uh, you're going to take the business, the way you're going to value the business is you're going to take the profit and it's going to be times by some multiple. Okay, so in other words, let's say the uh, studio is making £100,000 a year in profit and, let, uh, and the multiple is, uh, it varies by industry. Um, but there's naturally a range. The average multiple for businesses in general across the UK is 2.94. So let's say it's three. So in other words, if your business, uh, if the studio is producing 100,000 in profit, you times that by three, that would give you a valuation of 300,000 pounds. However, for a particular industry, there might be a range. The multiple might vary between two and four. So in other words, the business could be worth between 200,000 and 400,000 pounds. So the question becomes, well, what defines where in that range your multiple would fall? How much your business is worth? Anybody got any guesses? Well, what would, the, what would define whether your business was at the lower range of the valuation or at the higher range of the valuation? Yes, sir. Good. Great answer. How dependent it is on the business owner. That's exactly right. Or that's certainly, that is one example that would fit in the category of risk. In other words, Think about it, if you were buying a business, would you buy a business that was producing £100,000 net profit but that was all being produced by the one trainer that you were buying that business off? W which is going to be more valuable, buying it where there, where there is a studio with let's say 10 trainers and cumulatively they're producing £100,000 in net profit and the owner wasn't one of those trainers and all those trainers were going to continue working in that studio and all the systems were set up, it, that business clearly is going to be worth significantly more than if it was all dependent on the back of one trainer who was trying to say, I'll persuade my clients to come over and work with you and you're going to make a £100,000 profit. How many follow along with uh, what we're talking about so far? Show your hands. Okay, good. All right, so, um, uh, in other words, a key point I kind of want to make is um, I think that... Um, uh, Boys chase income, men chase wealth. Or let me take it and make it slightly less sexist. Uh, I think, I, I think um, immature, inexperienced business owners are just looking after the, how to make the next bit of money and smarter, wiser, more experienced business owners will chase wealth. And the key to creating wealth is creating assets or building assets. And that's one of the things that I love about what Sean and the MPE, uh, MPE team have done is they show you how to create systems um, uh, and assets which allows your business to be more solid, more stable consistently, right? I, I mean, guys, it, it, it's a bit like people deciding, the clients of yours deciding they want to get fit, so they just decide that they're going to train really hard, okay? Well, okay, that that might help move them a little bit, but actually you need to have a much better, more well-rounded, long-term plan, game plan, strategy, following the right uh, program in order to get the results you want, right? This just, make, uh, this just makes sense. So when you think about your business, you've got to be thinking about how do you make your business more stable, more solid? How do you have the um, assets to underpin it? So what I did next, which is, uh, was a complete train wreck, if I'm honest, was uh, I, from the coaching stuff, when I decided to get out of squash, I said, okay, um, I, I learned some speed reading techniques, some skills. I'd invested in my knowledge because I, I figured that if I wanted to um, accomplish success in my life, the way to do it 
was learn how to learn faster. I said, you know what, the things that I want to accomplish in my life, you know, the, the, the money, the lifestyle that I want, lots of other people have done it. And they've all, they've all written books. And if I could just get their knowledge in my head, that would allow me to um, accomplish those results faster. In the same way that you might go off and do training in particular types of methodologies which allow your clients to get results better and faster. So I learned to speed read. And I said, okay, how much can I leverage this knowledge? And I got so, um, uh, actually, how many of you are like me? Because uh, uh, a lot of business owners tend to be that when you get into something, you tend to be like a little bit obsessive compulsive and you tend to go all in. Who's a little bit obsessive compulsive? Your hands? Of course, good. Um, that, that's the nature of business owners. So, so I got so obsessed with the speed read and thought, how good can I get that I ended up entering the speed reading world championships? Just for fun. Um, the first year I came sixth, and that wasn't good enough, so the next year I came, I entered again and came third. And uh, I thought, right, I've got this immense skill set. I'm one of the fastest readers in the world. I can make a lot of money doing this. So I went out and said, right, I'm going to teach this. How, out of curiosity, how many of you in this room, uh, how many of you have kids? Okay, about half the room. So if you've got kids, ask a question for your kids. If you haven't got kids, ask it for yourself. Do you think it would enhance your children's lives if they could learn to read and comprehend a, a, a rate two, three times the rate that they do currently? Yes or no? Of course. So, so I went, this is the best skill that anybody can learn, something any child can learn. I'm one of the best uh, readers in the world. I was very good. I would go into schools for a day. We would test them at the start of the day, test their speed and comprehension at the end of the day, and we could double or treble their reading speed in that one-day workshop. So the results were fantastic. I said, this has got to be a, a home run. This has got to be you know, the best business of all time. Surely. What do you think happened? You know, in, in less than two years, I managed to uh, go from broke, having no money, to having minus 108, 109,000 pounds. And I, I, I was, my, everybody around me was pushing me to declare bankruptcy to kind of wipe this debt clean. And I said, this doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense how I can be so good at a particular skill set forgive the slightly egotistical comment, I just was aware that I said that, but um, uh, uh, how I can be so good at what I do and yet I'm not making money at it. Write this down. There is nothing more common in business than unrewarded expertise. You uh, feel comfortable answering this question because I assure you you're not going to be alone. Who here in fact, let, let me do it more uh, uh, universally. I want, I, I, everybody, take your hands, put them out in front of you like this. Okay? Use your right hand. Use your right hand as like a barometer. Show me from high to low how good your skill set is in whatever, uh, whatever your business specifically does. If you're great, fantastic, put it up here. If you're very poor and unskilled, put it down here. Use your right hand as a barometer. Good, okay? So you're saying, I can't reach the ceiling. Um, leave that hand there. Now take your left hand as a barometer. Show me your level of income. Extremely high, average, very low. Okay, good. Keep your hands where they are. Look around the room. Let me just see if I can see any exceptions. Okay, a few people are very close. The vast majority of the room, there's a huge discrepancy. Okay, you can put your hands down now. What does that tell you? Having a better product alone will not improve your income. Now, I'm not saying have a really crappy product. I think you need to deliver great value to your clients. But I, 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 the mistake that I made that perhaps some of you can relate to is I believe that if I just got better at the skills, uh, uh, the products, the skills that I was delivering to the clients, somehow, magically, that would turn into more money in my pocket. That's a lie and it's costing you money. I'll tell this story a bit later on, but um, uh, a, uh, a studio that I, uh, I bought into a while ago, the, the, the owner of that studio was obsessed with just doing more training, more advanced qualifications. Um, and what, when I became a co-owner with him, 
um, he came and pitched me and was like, hey, I want to go and do this training. I was like, how much is this training? And he said, four or five thousand pounds, whatever it was. I went, great, okay. Tell me the business case behind why this makes sense. He goes, oh, it's going to allow me to go from, I don't remember the hourly rate, but like from 55 pounds to 65 pounds an hour. I went, okay, how many of these, um, this type of uh, clients are you expecting to get? And he said, you know, two a week or whatever. I went, great, so you're expecting to boost the income by 20 pounds a week. Tell me how long it's going to take to get a return on this investment. And it was like 17.6 years or something <laughs> dramatic. Uh, 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 and I said, I I'm not convinced this is the best return on investment. Right? So, the, so um, uh, in fact, just humor me a little bit. I, take take your pen and piece of paper right now. And I want you to write down, and nobody else is going to look at it. So you can write it really teeny tiny small. And I'm not going to ask you it's for your benefit, not for mine. And nobody else is going to see this. Write down the biggest problem in your business right now. Write down the single biggest problem you've got in the business. Take 10 seconds to do that now. All right. So now, when you look down at your piece of paper, when you look down at your piece of paper, look down what you wrote down. Is this a pretty big problem? Yeah. Okay, something like yeah. Uh, um, yeah, it's a big problem. Now, ask yourself this. Is what you've written down the problem? Or is it the symptom? Is what you wrote down the problem? Or is it the symptom of a deeper underlying cause? How many of you, when you look down and go, oh, yeah, what I wrote down, actually, it's the symptom. Show of hands. Good, thank you for your honesty. Because most people go, oh, I don't have enough money if I had more investment. That's, that's bollocks, that's utter crap. It, 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 in most cases, it really is. Because the, re the reason why you don't have the money is because of a deeper root cause. The reason why you can't raise the money is because you don't have a strong enough business case or business model or whatever the root cause may be. For me in the uh, speed reading business, I had a phenomenal product. I should have been making a tremendous amount more money than I was making. But the, uh, I believe the root cause wasn't the lack of money. It was the lack of uh, uh, sales and marketing systems to attract clients and make money. The root cause in that business was not to do with the product. It was I didn't have the sales and marketing systems to attract leads and convert those leads into paying customers so I could make money. How many can relate to this? Show of hands? Good. All right, so um, I, I, um, uh, it took me a while to figure this out. So I said, how do I solve this problem? How do I, how do I solve this problem? And I was uh, fortunate in what I chose to do was um, uh, I kind of met a guy. Um, I, I, I recognized my inability to sell. My inability to sell was the problem, and I went and got a job working in sales for, for a, uh, a man who became a men an early mentor for me for many years, who was exceptional in the, in the sales side of things. And by studying and learning uh, from him, I learned uh, to develop uh, the skill sets around sales, and I started making a lot of money. And after I had started making a lot of money with him, and I developed that skill set, an asset that I could use, I then went out and started my next venture. Only this time, I was determined not to lose a six-figure sum. I was determined to make much more. But uh, I suppose the key point for me is this. How, how many of you have, um, um, in, in terms of your physical conditioning, how many of you have uh, mentors or advisors or coaches uh, or pay, people where you go that you look up to, where you learn from, um, in order to enhance your own physical conditioning. Show of hands. Okay, great. By show of hands, how many have the same in the context of their business? Okay, good. So still a lot of hands, which is great, which makes sense because you're hearing you've invested being at this event and there'll be a lot of VIP uh, members in the room, but it was less hands. Uh, for, I believe the way to fast track your route to success is to learn from people that have already been there and done it. 
And that's why I spend an awful lot of my time sat where you are right now, in events, in seminars, coaches, mentors, who have done whatever it is that I'm uh, trying to do. I, d I don't think the easy, if a client's wanting to get in the best uh, uh, physical condition of their life, or the best health of their life, or whatever their specific uh, goals might be, and, th and they've got no background, they've got no information, but they just, you know, they, they've read Men's Health or, you know, they, 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 they've looked online and they're just going to try and follow a workout out of a book. The, uh, are their results going to be optimal? No. So, uh, like by working with you or with your business, the idea is they're going to be able to leverage and get better results. So, uh, for me, it's about being obsessive about finding the best possible systems and knowledge which allows everything else to happen more easily. I'm a big fan of saying, what's the one thing? What's the one thing that if I was to accomplish this, it would make everything else that I need to do either easier or unnecessary? And I think that uh, for if, you're, if you're aspiring greater income, they, uh, greater, more clients, more leads, more stable business, uh, you want to sell your business in the long term, great. Uh, I, I think that the solution is in knowledge that you can get from other people that have been down that path. So what I did is I, I wanted to create a coaching business. I, inv uh, uh, I invested um, uh, 600,000 pounds in ultimately uh, buying the systems, intellectual property, etc., in order to be able to do that. But there was a problem. I didn't have 600,000 pounds. And um, my, before, so when I had the opportunity to kind of get involved with this business and buy, and, uh, uh, buy these assets, which I believe would produce me income, I kind of remember going to my mentor and saying, but oh, this, this is a big problem. I don't, I don't have any money. I don't have enough money to do this. I get that I could, I could buy this business for 600,000 pounds that was making 200,000 pounds a year in profit. But the problem is I've got, he goes, how much money do you have? I'm like, I've got zero pounds. Right? I maybe had a couple of thousand pounds to spare. He said, I, I, he said, Dan, his name is JJ, he said, Dan, he said, the, you saying that tells me you're never, if you keep thinking that way, that methodology, that belief system, you are never going to create wealth. He says, you're saying you don't have the money, therefore you can't buy the assets. But if you don't have the assets, you're never going to have the money. You're going to sit there chasing clients individually, one at a time, making a tiny little bit of money, which you're then going to squander away, and then you're never going to develop the assets, therefore you're never going to be able to leverage your income. I said, well, how do I do this? He said, that's a better question. And I figured out, uh, I, I, I negotiated a deal so I could pay for this uh, £600,000 purchase of assets, systems, marketing, intellectual property. I could pay for it over a three-year period. Now, just think about it logically. Um, if £600,000 over three years is £200,000 a year, how much profit did I tell you the business was making? £200,000 a year. So we agreed a small down payment, which was... I don't know, 20 or 30,000 pounds, which was a lot for me back then. I had to go and borrow some of that. Um, but in effect, I used the profit of the business to pay for the business. And then that allowed me to make the money and I made the business better by buying a lot of the things that you'll learn here this weekend to make the, uh, the business better, which meant that it made more money so that a lot of the profit was going out to pay off the debt so I could own the assets in the long term, but it also produced extra profit, which meant I could afford to live. How many follow along with this? Show of hands? Okay. So, um, uh, and ultimately, that was the first business that I sold um, um, for a seven-figure sum. Because I developed the systems and the assets. And I think that when you hear the different speakers present here over, over these three days, over the next day and a half still, to, or the next two days really, still to come, um, I don't think about it as individual tactics. I think you've got to think about it as a... Um, uh, a holistic system, right? So uh, I think at a high level, it's useful to think about how do I make my business more profit and how do I increase the multiple so the va overall valuation of my company is higher. I think the multiple is determined by how stable your business is and how fast it's growing. 
if you apply the, the strategies that MPE teaches with you, especially where are the VIP clients in the room? Where's the VIP pack? Great. So all the things that you guys are learning, the systems that you're getting, getting them into place makes your business more stable. It creates a, a greater level of recurring revenue. Right? I'm sure this has been mentioned, even though I wasn't here yesterday. I'm sure it, if it's not been mentioned, it will be mentioned. But what's more valuable? If you've got a studio that has, let's say it's got annual revenues of £100,000. If you've got Studio A that's got the revenues, it's all done on a client's pay per session. And Studio B, every single client is locked into, into a 12-month contract where they're automatically billed every single month. So Studio A, every client's paying as they go per session. Studio B, um, uh, every single client is locked into a 12-month contract and they're paying the cards automatically billed every single month. Let's say the expenses are the same, so the profitability of these two businesses are the same. Which business is worth more? A, where everyone's paying as they go, or B, where it's all locked in, contracted, recurring revenue? Which business is worth more? B. B, right? So uh, this just is the way that you should be working, because ultimately, even if you don't intend to sell your business, you might go, Dan, I don't care. I've got no desire to exit my business. I love what I do. Great. Do it anyway, because it makes your business more stable, more profitable. If you create your business so that it could be sold, if at some point in the future you change your mind, a life uh, incident occurs and you decide that you want to emigrate, you decide that you want to, or you say there's a, a, um, an incident, you get divorced, or whatever, and you decide that you need or want to exit the business, you can. But in the meantime, it creates a more stable business, which means you get to make more money whilst you own the assets. Now, that, that was a brief comment on multiples, but I actually think, um, let's talk about making more profit, which is um, a lot more fun and a lot sexier, I think. Um, actually, first of all, um, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit paranoid, um, just to make me feel better, hopefully, depending on how you answer the question. Um, are you getting any value from this? Yeah. Good, all right. I'm semi-congruent, so I can, I can keep going a little while longer. So, so the, um, let's talk about making more profit. You want your business to make more profit, okay? There's only two ways, only two ways that you can make more profit. Somebody tell me one of those two ways. Okay, uh, good, uh, thank you. That, uh, that was actually two ways, but uh, uh, you're right that you can decrease your expenses or you can increase your revenue, okay? increase your revenue or increase your sales. That's it. Now, of those two, which is the easier to accomplish, all the things being equal? If you've got already, if you're already established trading business, um, how many people here have already got clients, they've already got, they've already got a business, i.e. they're not a startup? Show of hands. Okay, good, so the majority of the room. Um, of these two, which is easier, decrease expenses or increase sales? Which one? Increase sales. Interesting. Okay. So, um, let me ask a better question. That was a very nice way of saying that was the wrong answer. Uh, um, <laughs> if you want to increase your profit, okay, you've got a choice between increasing sales or decreasing expenses. Which one is easier to do, to increase profit? Decrease okay, good. It's decreased expenses. Let me tell you why. Let's say you've got sales of 100, you've got expenses of 80, and you've got profit of 20, right? Let's say your studio does 100,000 pounds a year, you've got 80,000 pounds worth of expenses, paying all the trainers, paying the rent, paying the rates, whatever, you've got 20,000 pound in profit. Um, if you were able to, and when I go into businesses, the first thing I'll do is I'll look at unnecessary expenses. Most business owners have a blind spot because they're so focused on creating new revenue, they don't pay enough attention to this number. If you were able to um, decrease these expenses by 10%, but just by being more competitive, shopping around, negotiating harder, it's... Uh, anybody in this room, unless you are super militant, super, super, super militant, you probably, uh, and you probably don't believe me right now, but I assure you, you sat down with somebody, who could, a mentor that could help you, you could probably find a way of cutting that from... 80 to 72 without having any negative impact on sales. If you save eight here, where does that eight in savings go? 
straight to the bottom line, which means the 20 becomes 28, which is equivalent to a 40% increase in profitability. Now, if you increase this by 8, oh, let's say increase by 10%, so it increases by 10, right? Do, where does that money go? It, it gets split because you're going to incur some cost of making that sale because if the client signs up for, uh, uh, for a package, a certain degree of delivery needs to occur. Trainers need to be paid. There's some cost of fulfillment. If they're getting, uh, uh, depending on what your package is, if they've got supplements included, that needs to be paid for and fulfilled. So there's a certain cost of goods, which means some of that money is going to come over here, so less is going to drop for the bottom line. So the easiest route is to find a way to decrease expenses. Let's talk about where most expenses go. Uh, most expenses go on labor costs. Right? Or something when you're approaching any degree of size. So how do you get the best out of your people? You make sure that there are systems that allow them to, to perform at the highest level that they can. Right? That's what, and that's what you guys get from MPE, especially the VIP clients. That's what you get by learning those systems to be able to train and empower your team so they can follow the right methodology. So ultimately, you can get the best return on your investment in them as trainers. Okay? Um, but, but in addition to that, how many people in this room, um, how many people in this room would have a, 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 a lot more money in their bank account right now if they just hadn't wasted so much money on trying stupid ideas that seem like a good idea at the time? Show of hands. Of course, right? So, so how, do you, how, do you, how do you avoid the stupidity tax? Right? And, the, and the answer is, you look at people who've, who've done it before, you look at other people that are in the same business as you, that have achieved uh, better results, and you go and study, and you learn. You learn from what they do right, but you also learn from what people do and the stupid mistakes that they make to avoid having to make those mistakes yourself. How many agree with me? Show of hands. Okay? Good. So... We're back to the same thing. It's about having systems, investing in knowledge, and, uh, and the way that you get that knowledge is going from the right people or the right mentors. However, there's a limitation to this model. What is it? You can only, it, let's say you had the perfect magical business and you had zero expenses. You got that to zero pounds and you, and you still got 100,000 pounds in sales and your clients were happy, so that was sustainable. That would mean the maximum your profit could be would be 100,000 pounds. Well, if you're making 20, you're now making five times more profit. That's pretty great. But what if you want to make more than £100,000 in profit? The only answer is to increase your sales. It, so, in other words, it, it's, it's, not a, um, it, it's not a choice of just get the one magical thing that works. As a business owner, I believe you need to have, have an overview of the whole spectrum. In the same way, somebody doesn't just come in and say, yeah, okay, uh, uh, I want uh, six-pack abs, so I, so I want to do a lot of crunches. I mean, come on, you can't, like, whilst you can work towards a specific goal, you have to take into consideration the, the whole picture, right? True or false? True. True. So you need to understand the whole model. So um, when it comes to increasing sales, there are only three ways to do it. There are only three ways. Every single marketing strategy you've ever heard, ever, uh, or sales strategy, any idea that's going to come off this stage, if it's related to increasing your sales, is going to fall in one of three camps. Somebody tell me what uh, one of those three camps is. How do, you, how do you increase your sales? Oh, wow, okay, that one doesn't normally come out first, but so uh, uh, the gentleman said increase the average ticket sale, which I would call the average order value. In other words, when they buy, they buy... A larger amount. They spend a larger amount of money. Good, that's one. What's another one? Okay, good. Um, you can tell that you guys want some good stuff because this is coming out in a reverse order than the way it normally would, which is increasing average order frequency. In other words, increase the number of times that a client will purchase from you. And what's the third one? What's the one that most business owners say first? Yeah, you get more clients. So you increase the number of customers or clients. Okay? That's it. Now, here's the fun bit of these three. So let's relate it back to ourselves and our fitness businesses. You can either get more people to come in and try, try you out or try your studio out for the first time. You can get them to buy bigger packages or spe more expensive packages uh, when they're there. Or you can get them to come back and make more uh, uh, purchases in the future. 
of these three, which one is the most difficult to do? Is it to get people to try you for the first time, getting them to, uh, when they've decided to buy from you, to buy a bigger or better package, or to get them to come back again in the future? Which of those three is the most difficult? The first one, yeah. Uh, increasing the number of clients is most difficult. Tell me why. Trust. Trust, what do you mean? Yeah, they never bought from you, so they don't necessarily trust you. Good, absolutely correct. What else? It costs a lot more to acquire a new customer to you know, resell to you. It does cost a lot more, which is true, but by the way, which has an even bigger impact on profit. Okay, uh, but why does it cost more to acquire the customer for the first time? One reason is trust. What's another reason? Because they don't know you exist. They don't know you, they don't necessarily like you or your style or your marketing or your approach and they don't trust you. Okay? So that's why this is the most difficult thing to do. And yet, where do 90% where do of business owners spend 90% of their time when they're trying to increase sales? Chasing new clients. Chasing new clients. It's not the low-hanging fruit. Look, I, I don't believe that you can get amazing results with um, zero effort. I'm not a fan of get rich quick. In the same way, uh, uh, I, I doubt anybody in here believes that people can magically transform uh, their uh, physical condition or their health instantaneously. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. But I am a fan of leverage. I am a fan of having the easiest, quickest, optimal route to the solution. I mean, that's why the clients come to you. They come to you because you're showing them a better, easier, more effective way of getting the, the outcomes that they want. Right? Okay. So, so uh, if, if I was involved in your business, if I was sat in your shoes, uh, when I bought my first studio, when I also when I kind of built my first studio, the first thing that I looked to do and it's the first thing, because uh, obviously I picked MPE, uh, MPE's brains in this. I've uh, 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 invested a lot in my knowledge uh, with MPE, and that's why I think the VIP program is so great, because it's worked for me. The first thing that I did was I, I, I figured out how to increase the average order value. So I, I found out a way to position and raise the prices, and I figured out a way of packaging the prices so that people were on monthly packages uh, recurring ongoing packages rather than just paying for a block booking of uh, 12 sessions or pay as they go. Do that first, you'll have a, a significant impact on sales but as the gentleman over here astutely pointed out, actually uh, because the cost of acquiring those customers is that additional revenue is less, the profit goes up by even more. So you might increase your sales by 50% but you've more than doubled your profits. Th this it's just fantastic. So increasing the average order value is the easiest. That's the thing that I would do first. We've said that uh, this is the most difficult, therefore average order frequency is next. And that's why having clients on monthly contracts is a smart idea. And by the way, not only does this increase your revenue, it also will increase the valuation of your business. Why? Because as you all correctly pointed out, if all the clients are paying as they go, your business is going to be worth less than clients that are into some kind of contract. Why? Because as an investor, if somebody's looking to evaluate how much your business is worth, if people are paying as they go, that's more unstable, more scary than if you've got all these clients locked into monthly contracts on an ongoing basis. Okay? So, um, uh, let me just check. I haven't missed any more. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, yeah, good. Uh, let me just check out if I missed any key points. I don't think I have. So th this, is how, this is how you drive profit. It's not only how you drive profit, but how you drive value for your business. Okay? Just think about this model. And everything you've got goes under these categories. But ultimately, you want to make sure that it's within systems. So you want to be investing in the, system, in the knowledge that you're getting, the mentors that you're getting it from, and the systems, because that's assets. They're things that make your business worth more. Okay? So, let's talk about, um, uh, let me talk a little bit more about um, uh, uh, my first studio. So, I was training um, um, at a studio, a PT studio, and um, I, uh, the quality of the trainers in this particular facility was phenomenal. I already told you that they, they um, 
the owner he invested heavily, heavily in his own development, and he uh, uh, disseminated that advice amongst the fellow trainers. And I think that was good. So the quality of training was extremely high, and I was really happy. I was really, really happy uh, with it. Um, the reason why I ended up at the studio is because, you know, I'd read a little bit, and at the time I was uh, um, uh, really into Paul Czech, um, and I looked for people that had Paul Czech qualifications in the area. And to be fair to this studio owner, they had a, he had a qualification which caused me to seek them out, and lo and behold, uh, um, he actually introduced me to all other uh, types of information and advice beyond just what kind of Paul taught that I was a fan of. And that caused me to become a client of theirs. And I was really ha happy, but I noticed that this trainer was working 65 plus hours a week and he was making less than 2,000 pounds a month. Right? He had trainers in his own studio that were making as much or more, th more than him without any of the risk. And yet, he was one of the most skilled trainers that I've ever uh, had the fortune of training with. And I just felt that was a travesty. But what was the solution to his problem? What, or what did he think was the solution to his problem? Get more information, get myself more skilled. Let's develop my product. I know, let's become the third fastest reader in the world and I'm guaranteed to make more money. It's not the answer. The answer uh, is if you want more revenue, is to get the right sales and marketing systems. But beyond that, it's not about getting revenue, it's about getting profit and uh, and building it in a sustainable way which means your business is worth more money and because uh, I saw him struggling I said hey well let's figure this out because I saw the potential uh, uh, the fact is that um, I certain for most people in this room perhaps not the ones who have been with MPE and the VIP program for, for, for a while uh, but the ones that are just kind of new to this world your business, you deserve to have a two, three, four, five times as much money as you're currently getting right now. It's just that you haven't put in place the systems that are going to allow you to leverage that. And if I were you, I would become obsessive about acquiring those assets, or about acquiring that information, about uh, investing in that mentoring, in that advice, so you can get those systems in place that d don't just make you money this year, but next year, the year after that, the year after that, the year after that. Yeah? Because if you can figure out how to do it in one studio in a way that's not dependent upon you, you can figure out how to do it in a, open a second and third facility. So uh, I, I went to uh, this studio owner, his name's Ollie, and said, hey, how about we become partners in this thing? And his, de his demands were high because w w when you're... Um, and it's easy for me to say from the outside, but when you're in your own business, you often can't see the wood for the trees. Do you know what I mean? So uh, you, see the, you see the members hit up here on stage talking about their success stories, and you go, wow, that's amazing. Uh, and yet you go, yeah, but that's not going to work for me because I'm in this area, and this is a poor area. They're in a wealthy area. Or, yeah, well, they had a budget to spend on Facebook. Or, yeah, well, they don't have the competitors that I have in this particular area. And, and I think that they're limiting beliefs that we often restrict ourselves from getting the growth that we want, but from the outside it's sometimes easier, which is why it's good to have mentors. Mentors that can push you and say, no, your, your business is not different. It will fit this model. I know you won't believe it does, because the reason you don't believe it does is the reason why you haven't done it. If you thought it was a good idea and you knew that it was going to work, you would have already done it. And that's why taking that next step, taking that growth, changing your business, when I went to Ollie and said, right, we're going to change the business. We're not going to charge per session. We're going to raise the rates from £40 an hour to £65 an hour equivalent, and people are going to have to have a minimum of a three-month uh, uh, contract, three to 12-month contract. That's all we're doing. That's the only way that we're going to do it. And if they don't like it, then the clients are going to leave. Do you think he was super excited about this idea? <laughs> no, he was mortified because he was, he, he was more afraid of what he was going to lose. Uh, because he didn't have the benefit of the experience. And by the way, I'd never done it in a studio. I'd done stuff like this with lots of other businesses I'd been involved with, so I was more confident. But what made me more confident still is I'd looked to Sean and the MPE team, and they made me feel confident that this would work. While there's no categorical guarantee, they're like, look, here's all our members. Here's all our clients that have done exactly the same things, and, and it's made a significant difference to their business. 
So we put the systems in place, um, and uh, lo and behold, in about 12 months, the revenue increased by 230%. The business became much more profitable. So even though uh, I had a 50-50 split with Ollie, his 50% was now worth more and producing more money than when he'd had 100%. I think owning 100% of nothing isn't an especially good idea. Um, uh, and it grew. And then he got, to the, he got to the place where he said, hey, you know what, Dan? Like, I feel I can do this on my own now. And he brought me back out. So uh, in that window, the business grew by 230%, and he brought me back out at a significant profit to me. But he's very happy. And now I'm looking at, uh, I'm now looking, currently in negotiations for another studio because the thing is, guys, by learning this information, the information that you're learning from MPE, you're going to get a skill set which you can apply to any business that you go into. I, I, if you really want to create wealth and freedom, create the systems, invest in the assets, the knowledge to create the systems so the business works without being dependent on you. How many agree with me on this one? Show of hands. Good. All right. So, yeah. Here's my favorite little thing at the moment. Um, uh, let's, let's tie all this together. Because by the way, that's leverage. That is what leverage is. That's what leverage is about. Um, it's about creating the systems assets so you can have more trainers, more studios, more clients, and you're making more money, but without having to have more time. So all my time's involved now, as I know is true for uh, some of the VIP members and the VIP pro members that I know, that they're, they're focused on overseeing the business strategically. Uh, of course, many keep their hand in with clients just because they enjoy, they enjoy it. They want to. They want to keep their hand in. I'm good with that. If you love it, just don't have a business where you have to do that. And then when you can't do it for some reason, all of a sudden your income drops through the floor and you start paying to run your business because it's making a loss. I don't think that's a good idea. Okay? So, uh, uh, let's, let's tie this all together. Um, this, what I'm about to throw on this piece of paper, um, if applied in your business, will make you a phenomenal amount of money. The person that taught this to me is, uh, is, is a gentleman by the name of Keith uh, Cunningham. He's well worth checking out. Um, uh, let's play a game. Let's say that we're going to open a new studio. Okay? Let's say that together we've got here, this is an investors meeting. And we want to make more money. We want to leverage the skills that we've learned here at MPE. And we want to open the ultimate studio. And we're all going to help loads of clients and get very rich. Who's in favor of that idea? <laughs> okay, good. So let's do it. So what's the, what do we need to do in order to open a new studio? A new studio. Well, what are the first things that we need to do? Okay, we need to find a premises. Good, because we, we need somewhere... To, to, to do it, right? We're going to have to either sign a lease. What else are we going to need? Let's say we've now got an empty building. It's this room. We've leased this room. What do we need to do now? Kit. Right, we need some kit. Okay? So if you think about the room, if you think about the kit, if you think about anything else that we need to be able to open this studio, you could look, give all those a label. It begins with A. What, what's that term? Assets. assets. So in other words, we're going to invest in assets. The shareholders of a company invest in assets. You know, if you went to a company's house right now, if you went online to form a new company, it would ask how much the, uh, in shares have been bought. And normally it's like 100 shares at a pound each. So in other words, the shareholders have invested 100 pounds in to start this company up, right? But the reality is, if you open a studio, there's going to be a much higher level of investment in assets. Now, it seems like a stupid question, okay? But why do we need these assets? Well, I mean, why bother to have, well, why, why do we need, because we do need it, why do we need the premises, why do we need the kit? Well, that's an interesting response. Why, why, why do we need the kit? To attract people. Well, to attract people, and we want to attract people, so loads of people are now milling around. What, what are we looking to do with those people? Training. Working to train them, and what are we looking to get in exchange for that training? Yes. Money, we're looking to make sales, right? So we're investing in assets, so the, the marketing that we're putting out there, the, the studio that we've built, the trainers that we employ, they are, in effect, assets that we're investing in, and we're investing in those assets to produce revenue, to produce sales. Okay? Good. 
Why? Why do we want to make sales? Yeah, because you want to make a profit. Does anybody here want to grow their revenue by £100,000 only to have all £100,000 be spent on, uh, on expenses to create that revenue? Right? Of course not. Uh, although, by the way, don't overlook the irony. That's how most businesses operate. Right? Uh, in fact, you're in safe hands. I will be raising my hand many times to answer this question. How many in here have, uh, have, a, have sometimes seen a, an increase in revenue but it's not turned into more money in their pocket. Show of hands. Right, okay? So you're taking those sales and you want to uh, turn it into profit. Okay? Now, here's a fun bit. Many of, you th uh, uh, many of you think, as I did, that profit's what you want. It's not. You don't actually want profit. You can't pay bills with profit. You can't... Um, go and buy a holiday. You can't invest in other assets with profit. Why? Because profit is a, is a theory. What is it that you actually want? You want cash. And most business owners don't understand that profit and cash is not the same thing. Is it possible to have a profitable business and have no money? Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. Do businesses uh, go broke uh, because they've, uh, they're on paper, they're a really good business. They've got a lot of revenue. They've got a lot of profit. But they go broke because they are unable to pay their bills. Yes or no? Yes. yes. So profit and cash aren't the same thing. Somebody tell me, how can that happen? How can you make a profit but not have... If I make, if I make £100,000 in profit, why does that mean I don't have £100,000 cash in the bank? How do, how do those two things not connect? Yeah, discrepancy between when you're paying your bills, when you get the money, credit. In other words, if you make a sale, um, and, but you give the client 30 days to pay, for instance, that, uh, and then they, uh, you've made the sale, you've delivered the goods, you've earned that money. On paper, you have earned that money, but they default and they don't hand over, or you've got other bills to pay before that becomes time. Let's say you sign a big contract with a massive corporate, and they're going to send all these people to your facility. But their terms are, um, uh, like for example, I, I invested in a company that did uh, cleaning contracts for the NHS. Got a big seven-figure cleaning contract with a hospital. Um, do you know what the NHS's terms were? 180 days. So in other words, this company had to pay its cleaners, pay for all the product facilities for six months before the bill got paid. Now, it was very, very profitable. But the problem was that he was going to run out of money before he get there. And that's why he approached a variety of people, investors including me, and we lent money to that business at an interest rate, which meant that uh, he could afford to fund that so that he could make the money in the long term. Now, here's why this is relevant. The skill set of the skills and tools that you need to know around creating assets are different than the skill sets around creating sales. The skills and tools around creating sales are different than the skills and tools about uh, making a profit. This is about driving revenue. This, turning it into profit, is about controlling expenses. A lot of business owners, some people in this room will be very good at driving sales, closing deals, making it happen. But in, in relation to themselves, they are very weak at uh, managing expenses, which means they're, they're not very efficient at turning that sales into profit. In the same way that you might have a client that's great aerobically but poor anaerobically. They're very strong in their upper body but they're weak in their legs. Like it, it's, it's out of alignment, it's disproportionate. Yet this is a sequence that occurs. Ultimately, in this business, you're looking to invest in a business so it produces surplus free cash flow for you, the business owner. This... Um, this is a, uh, you can look at the assets you've got and the sales you've got, and this is a measure of how effective management is about turning those assets, the intellectual property, the systems, the ideas, into revenue. This is a measurement of uh, how efficient, um, would help if I could spell, uh, efficient uh, management is, you are, the owner is, at turning the sales into profits. And this is a measurement of how productive 
Management is at turning profit into cash. This is the whole game. You can, if you can establish what this number is, this number is, this number, and this number is, you can figure out these ratios and the whole name of the game. Every single idea that you've got is simply about how do you imp improve these ratios. If you do that, your business will put more cash in your bank account. But you're only as strong as your weakest link, and most business owners are strong, are strong at one, one of these four, um, and they're weak at one or more of these four. So that they're great at making sales, but they're not good at managing expenses and turn it into profit. They're great at managing expenses, but they're bad at driving sales. Or they're great at doing all of that, but they don't, they're not good at creating assets to allow them to continue to expand. They're great at making all the sales, but they're terrible at collecting the cash so 